the Governor Bado's case and that of Joey and Monica's death. Just to mention a few, she started it before handing it over. Um, on my far end, I have Mr. Clement Okech. He is also the Vice Chair, Bail and Bond Implementation Committee, as well as the Assistant um, to the Director of Probation and Aftercare Service. It's good to have both of you this morning. Thank, Thank you, you so you. much Thank for you, making Jesse. time um, to be with KTN News and really help our viewers understand this. Um, Lady Justice, I'll begin with you. And the one question that Kenyans would want to understand this morning, just to set the foundation of this conversation, mm. what is the difference between bail and bond? And they're both constitutional rights to any Kenyan, mm -hmm. but what's the difference between both? Okay, <laughs> there's not, not much difference. Mm -hmm. uh, when you say you're releasing somebody on bail, that means that there, there's... Um, uh, sometimes the court has the discretion to order for some money to be deposited right. uh, with the court, and that is cash bill, so that the person can be able to be released. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you do not ask for any uh, cash bill or any monies to be deposited. Maybe you want a security, a surety, uh, and then uh, you release the person on a certain amount which is quoted on the bond. Mm -hmm. So that is bond. So one involves really. Uh, Deposit of some money, the other one may or may not involve money. Right. Yes. Are all offenses bailable in Kenya? Yes, under the new constitution, all of them are bailable, subject to the existence of compelling reasons. Right. Not may to ask release. Why? Why are all offenses bailable? Uh, you remember we had a referendum, and before that, a long process uh, that was looking into the constitution. Mm -hmm. Uh, so before the 2010 constitution, which is a promulgation and the 2010 constitution, mm -hmm. uh, some certain cases, uh, offenses were not bailable. For instance, all those cases where the sentence was capital, mm -hmm. and that means a death sentence. Mm -hmm. So we had treason, we had uh, murder, robberies uh, with uh, the uh, capital robber, that's robbery violence, 296 subsection 2. And then also the attempted robbery violence. Right. So there nobody could get bail and it was automatic. Right. No bail was available. But after the constitution, the Kansans felt, let's have everybody having this right. Mm -hmm. And the court having the power to exercise uh, discretion and determine who is it should be released and who is it should not be granted bail. Do you think that was, that was a mistake we did, making every offense bailable in Kenya? Uh, let me not say that because this was a decision of all the millions of Kenyans. That, okay. we, we even went through a referendum, you saw. Right. Uh, that overwhelmingly, Kenyans said, we want all these things in the, under the new mm -hmm. constitution, which includes every person uh, having a right to be released on bail, mm -hmm. subject to the existence of compelling reasons to deny. Right. So uh, that's what Kenyans wanted, and that's what they should now allow the courts to, to grant. Okay. So, Mr. Clement Okech, um, mm. Lady Justice has just taken us through um, not such a big difference, but the sort of gray and white area between a bond and a bail. One may be asking, okay, so what is a fine? What's the difference between that and a fine? Uh, thank you so much, Zinzi. Uh, first of all, uh, it needs to be understood that one comes before conviction, the other comes after conviction. Right. Uh, which means that uh, bond and bail uh, are terms and procedures that take place before the hearing of the matter. Mm -hmm. And that means, therefore, that if you're charged in court, uh, the first uh, hearing will be whether you'll be granted bail. That means literally getting out of court so that you can hear your cases uh, while outside, not being in custody, uh, whether uh, paying some money, uh, which will be refundable to you, or putting some collaterals in terms of securities, those come before uh, the hearing of that matter. Mm -hmm. uh, fines are actually punishment that come after conviction, which means the due process of hearing has taken place mm -hmm. and uh, you have been found culpable. And that means that you are convicted. And the court now, depending on the charge, depending on the offense for which you have been found guilty, the court now will decide whether you should be given a fine uh, alone or in lieu of, of, of imprisonment or in addition to imprisonment or any other of that. So therefore, fines come after conviction and after the process of hearing. Right. Yes. And what determines the amount of a bail or bond? Uh, it, there, there are many things that go into that. There are many, many things that go into that. And each case is considered uh, in its own uh, circumstances and merit. Mm -hmm. uh, even if you are charged 
three people, five people in a particular case, it doesn't mean that you all have to get the equal amount of bail or security terms for that bond that you may be asked by the court to secure your release. Why? Because uh, you, although you have been charged collectively, but when it comes to matters deciding on your bail, mm -hmm. though it would be considered that you should be treated equally, but your circumstances, your individual circumstances, and the issue of uh, whether you'll come to court is what is material. Mm -hmm. The court, uh, uh, and this is what the bail and bond policy guidelines strictly uh, adheres to, the court would only wish to see you coming to court. It is not just enough to look at the weight of the matter. The most interesting thing that the court looks at is whether what will secure your coming to court. Mm -hmm. So that means, therefore, that uh, if you are, uh, for example, charged with somebody who is endowed, well endowed, you'll find that person being able to secure his release out of a million shillings, cash bail. But then I, who is not able, not, who is lowly endowed, I may not be able to secure that. But through review of that uh, order that the court has given, I may come out you know, after paying maybe 100,000. Mm -hmm. So that means circumstantially, I wasn't able to pay that. And my 100,000 could be equal to the million that the other person gave. So again, it depends on the circumstances of each case and circumstances of each individual. Right, now there is the Bail and Bond um, Implementation Committee um, and the National Council of Administration of Justice, which developed a bond policy. Mm. It was gazetted in 2015. 15, yes. Its main core mandate is to sort of put guidelines for that. Just highlight to Kenyans and help us just understand a few of, the, of these highlights, a bit of them. Now, the Bail and Bond uh, Policy Guidelines is, uh, was developed by a collective, uh, should I say, body constituted by the Honorable uh, Chief Justice. A task force. A task force, right. first of all, uh, which I served in that task force. And uh, it is as a result of that, the product of that task force was the Policy Guidelines, which we now have and, uh, and, and which I would wish to show Kenyans it's in place and being practiced by all the courts mm -hmm. and by all police officers in the country. That task force, other than developing these policy guidelines, also gave us a raft of recommendations that needed to go into implementation of bail and bond as uh, the constitution demands and as uh, other procedures and regulations in the court would require. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the for example, one of the reasons why these policy guidelines came into being was to see how that Article 49, which talks about the right of the arrested person, and more specifically with regard to issuance of, of bail, uh, Article 49, 1H, which the judge will be able to speak elaborately about maybe later on, how that would then be entrenched into our manner of issuing of bail and bond at the, uh, both at the police stations and at, uh, at the courts, and which means therefore that this document does not speak to the court process alone. It binds both police issuing bail and courts issuing bail. Uh, secondly, that policy, uh, that task for the level of this policy guideline also looked at uh, other means beyond the current practice that we do in Kenya. We do not supervise bailies, for example. But the task force considered and put it in this policy guideline that in future <coughs> we may, there may be and there is need to have bailey supervision. Right. Uh, the circumstances of which we are still developing as we speak. And we're going to come to that supervision yeah. after one has perhaps failed um, a bond or bail. Um, Lady Justice Lissit, let me just come back to you. Mm. So corruption in Kenya is, is a war that we are fighting. And uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta has come out a number of times as, uh, as the president saying that the judiciary is undermining the war of corruption, saying that they're giving, the judges are giving lenient bail. So you have an individual who has stolen billions of taxpayer money that's supposed to go into projects within Kenya, be it the medical health, be it in the education system, and so forth. And they're given a bill of two million. Why? And shouldn't there not be a correlation between um, how much an individual has stolen in the case of a corruption and the bill that they get. Thank you so much, uh, Zinzi. First of all, I just want to emphasize that everybody has a right to bail. Right. Uh, as says Article 49, 1H says, unless there are compelling reasons. Mm. So that is the starting point. And the, you know the court has now the discretion. Are, are there compelling reasons not to grant this person bail? So once you have determined that actually there are no, no compelling reasons, then you must give that person bail. Mm -hmm. uh, the next thing to look at is that 
uh, uh, we have the duty to give reasonable bond terms. Now, reasonable bond terms should those terms that will enable this person to enjoy the right that they have under the Constitution, which is bail, irrespective of what the offence they are facing. Even though allegedly they have stolen billions. So, I like the word alleged yes. because that's what you have yes. said. So you cannot use the uh, granting of bail as a conviction. It, they have not been found guilty. Mm. They have not been tried. And the law is saying, give them reasonable bond terms unless there are compelling reasons. So if there are no compelling reasons, you'll be looking, of course, at what charge has brought them uh, before the court. Mm -hmm. Say, for instance, can you compare human life with the billions of shillings? Somebody has murdered, and then uh, somebody has uh, stolen billions. So which one ranks higher? And so we are not looking so much, uh, so much uh, at the... What, what has been done only per se. There are many other circumstances you have to look at. Look at this person. What is it it will be reasonable for them to afford? Because it also depends with the circumstances of the person. Okay? What have they done? What is reasonable for this person to afford? So if you, if you, you bring uh, a car to driver and you bring me uh, a CEO, uh, they are charged with the same offense. The court has the right to decide this CEO should pay a little higher cash right, bill. Right. This uh, hat puller should even maybe get just get off with a lenient, right. uh, you know, term right. for bond. And in that example where you have um, that cut driver and the CEO, yes. So you have then this um, politician who holds a, a very high seat who alleg allegedly, again I use that word, has stolen billions, then shouldn't that um, bail slash bond be one that feels the pinch of that billion that has been stolen? You see, Yaja, you don't know whether they stole or not. Mm -hmm. uh, so you cannot now use the bail as a punishment to them to feel the pinch and you have not tried them. Right. So you just look at what would be reasonable in the circumstances of this case, the circumstances of this person and what they did, mm -hmm. what would be reasonable. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, there are no hard and fast rules about this. Uh, we don't have anything to guide, uh, you know, a scale like to determine what is reasonable or not. But the court exercises the, what the best the best way they can, yes. they balance those scales. You are looking at the victim, you are looking at the crime committed, you are looking at the accused person, you are also looking at the public interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if, if they, they, you are saying they, they are alleged to have stolen a billion, you know you, they, they could not have carried that money just in a handicap unless they are charged with robbery with violence. Mm -hmm. Some of these charges come as uh, abuse of office, mm -hmm. you know, or... Uh, flouting procurement or fl flouting some procedure. So there is, you, you really cannot say, it's a whole chain of people, you can't say how much th these people, uh, each of them took away, you know, out of this maybe illegal and uh, illegal procedure mm. that caused this money to be, uh, you know, taken away. So you cannot say, because it is a billion, each of you should bring one billion shilling cash bills to be, because you are now saying, I'm very convinced you are guilty, so you must bring back that money, which... All right. Mm -hmm. Lady Justice, help us understand this scenario. Let me paint the picture. You have um, an individual, a poor individual, and a rich individual who have committed the same um, offense. And um, the rich individual gets a bill. He's able to pay for it. The poor person can't pay for the bill, and uh, they're, let, they're, they're left to rot as they await trial. What, in such, what about in such a scenario? One would say that the law is being unfair. Okay. But you see, once you have given those bail terms, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's difficult to know what will be, the person will be able to afford. So you do the best you can at the initial stage. Right. Uh, by the way, the court also has the other option before you determine, to help you determine, mm -hmm. you ask uh, probation, which is represented here uh, by Mr. Clement, you ask them to go and do a social inquiry, find out uh, the background of this person so that the court can be able to assess what is it that they can be able to afford. So there, there are many other avenues that the court can use mm -hmm. to be able to determine. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, of course, you listen to the defense, and uh, you, uh, you maybe they may have a submission to say exactly what are the circumstances of this person, mm -hmm. so that the court can be able to see what kind of a person they are.
maybe how, how much do they earn and how much is it would be reasonable for the court to ask for them to deposit or to stand for so that they can be released. Right. Yeah, and uh, so there is also the option of reviewing. So you have given bond terms, the accused person is not able to meet, but the court determined that this person is worthy of being uh, released mm -hmm. on bail mm -hmm. pending their trial. Mm -hmm. So you, the, the court has the duty thereafter to find out why is it that this person is still in, even though we granted them bail. And you can reduce downwards. So a bail or bond can be revised? You can review at any stage downwards to enable the person to meet the bond terms. Right. Mr. Yes. Ketch, take me through that. Yes, thank you very much, Azinzi. Well, you know, when uh, one is charged in court, mm -hmm. there are parties, there are many parties that play here. The prosecution is there, interested. Mm -hmm. The investigator, interested. Uh, the defense counsels, interested. There is the court, interested. Their interest, most of this, are the fear. The court fears of absconding of this person. The prosecution fears of absconding and interference with the witnesses or, uh, you know, revictimizing the person. Mm -hmm. the, the, the investigating officer fears that this case will be bungled. The victim fears that maybe I will be revictimized. And all this have to be weighed by the court and have to be considered by the court. Each of those fears may form a compelling reason how they are advanced. The lawyer, the counsel fears my client will be denied bail. Mm -hmm. Now, the court can order what we call a bail hearing in that circumstance in accordance with the policy guidelines. And in the bail hearing, all those fears will now be brought to light. In that process, the court may also order for what we call a bail information report or what we simply call a pre-bail report to be filed by a probation officer. A pre-bail report is a, a non-evidentiary report produced by the probation department to be able to assist the court determine the reasonability, as the judge said, there is no way of knowing the reasonableness of the term that the court should give you. That report will also allay some of these fears that I've spoken about because the probation officer has to investigate with and interview the victim and talk to, uh, look into the files of the investigating officer, look at those issues which were advanced, some of which could have been decided or I mean, deemed as compelling by the prosecution. Look at the person who is under, the, I mean, under trial the accused person, look at the means, and most importantly, and for that person who is unable to bail himself or herself out in the first instance, the community ties of this person. Because as it goes, the higher the community rating, the less likely this person will abscond. The, the higher the community, community rating. Right. In other words, the community ties. Yes. If you have higher, higher community ties, the less likely that you will abscond. Right. If you have a low rating, the high likely that you may abscond. There's that philosophy. So that means that when the report comes to court, then the court will now have to consider all those other issues which uh, the interested parties have said and this info independent information coming from the probation department in order to enable it to arrive at what is reasonable, reasonable non -ex not excessive, and what is most important. And I think that's the point that we need to underscore here and which the policy guidelines talks, talks about. The issue is not about the amount. The court is simply interested in your attendance at court, period. And therefore, you hear people being given personal bonds, or what they call personal recognizance or free bond. It's because it's only interested in you attending court. Similarly, the police officer in charge of station is only supposed to think whether you are going to attend court tomorrow if you are to be released on cash bail. In other words, the most important factor is your attendant has court. All right, but Mr. Keshe, if you look at our remands, they're crowded with um, peop uh, poor people who can't afford um, the bail or bond, right? Yeah. And if the courts are to do the due diligence and see, and see um, the background of this specific person, wouldn't they then not grant them the freedom that they deserve? Are those guidelines fair? Exactly, that is what uh, is supposed to happen. Like Judge said, you may be able to reduce all the terms that you had said coming downwards. Mm -hmm. And this report may be able to help you understand the circumstances of that individual in custody who is unable to bail himself out. For instance, it could be that nobody knows they're in prison. 
Then right, their family members don't know. Don't know. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows they're in prison. It could be that the land security that they could have brought to court is under contestation by the family. So which may have, therefore, if that is the only security that they could have brought to court, there's none. So which are the other alternatives? So those in remand custody, would they be given a chance to be informed? And that's what the policy guidelines talks about. What other, what other documents may you produce in court for your being bailed out and that would compel you to come to court? For your hearings? For your hearings. Because you have to show up. You have to show up. All right. That's the most important part. Lady, and you've really emphasized yes. on it. Uh, Lady Justice, let me come back to you. Um, does the economic status and, and, or the social status of an individual influence what bail or bond they receive? Okay, thank you so much, Zinzi. The economic status of a person does not influence uh, how much they are given. Mm. But it may be a guide, eh? depending with what kind of an offense somebody is, is, uh, uh, is charged with. But it shouldn't determine how much they'll be given. Mm. Yeah, and that is why, uh, okay, you are saying the poor ones are in the prison. Uh, sometimes that's not quite correct. They are not, um, they are not there because they are poor. Um, uh, and the court is unreasonable. It, uh, some of them, uh, you know, they do, not, uh, they do not ask for a review downwards mm. so that the court can be able to review. And others, the court have done their best. You know, like uh, recently we went out, we, were, we, were, we went out on a sensitization and also an evaluation and monitoring, uh, you know, uh, visits. We, we did uh, regional visits. And uh, in one of the regions that we visited, we found very many young people in prison because we also go to the prison we also look at the data to see how many people are in there and what are the kind of offenses they are in for and uh, you know to, to just understand why are they there and uh, sometimes we give uh, feedback uh, to the court so what we found some uh, one of the courts was giving very high bond terms the other one was giving um, lower you see so the, the one giving higher is contributing to the numbers going up in the prison, and we informed them. But the other thing we discovered is that there, is a, a, there was a culture issue, uh, the, that um, these people, their culture is, once you are arrested, whether it is by the police or you have been taken to court for trial, they want nothing to do with you because you are now like a curse. It's like a curse. So they want nothing to do with you. So when the court gives the bond terms, in fact, many of them were in for uh, orders of a uh, cash bill of 3,000, you see, uh, 3,000 only. You pay 3,000 so that you may be released. Right. And uh, they are not able, because they, they don't have the money, but the family can be able to afford that money. But because of this culture that it is a curse, they want nothing to do with you. We and once happy. you are released, right. you have to go through some uh, rituals to be able to admit it back into the family. So you see, that's culture contributing to the numbers. Right. So yeah, and, culture plays a And we way. had to talk to the chiefs, because we also had an opportunity to talk to the chiefs, to tell them, please go back to your people and tell them, their children are rotting in court, I mean in prison, because of very little terms. They can be able to sell something, mm -hmm. to be able to raise that money, pay the cash bill, and after the case is over, whether or not the person is found guilty, the money will be refunded to right. them. And I want to believe that our courts are sensitive towards mm -hmm. um, vulnerable children, lactating mothers, um, people living with mental or physical disabilities. So when these individuals cannot, um, or rather they fail to come up with a bail or bond that has been requested, what other options do they have on the table for them? Perhaps supervision orders? You know, what we do, like, for instance, the children, you don't ask the child to do anything. Right. You ask the either parent or guardian. To, for the children. To stand for them. Mm. And sometimes they just sign, sign a free bond. Mm. They sign some... Um, you know, recognize, as you say, that uh, you ensure this person comes to court and if they fail, you be, you, uh, uh, I ad agree with the court that I should pay the amount the court will determine in that bond for me to forfeit. That's if for I'm children. Not. That's for children, even the mentally challenged people. Mm -hmm. yeah, if, the, if, if there is no reason not to grant them bail, you know, some of them may be they are a danger to themselves, a danger to the community, you may not release immediately. Mm -hmm. But uh, where you can, you also ask some guardian to stand surety for them. We will now ensure that this person comes to the court. All right, Mr. Yes. Clemento Ketch, in this war of corruption, would you say there is a weak link between the interagencies when it comes to fighting corruption? Um, 
I think that's a very sensitive area and uh, I wouldn't want to delve much in it. But uh, what I want to say is that uh, there is no institution or organ of government that would say is divorced of uh, corruption. Mm. Corruption permits every part of society, unfortunately. And uh, of course, there has to be concerted effort in accordance with the mandates given with those uh, organs. So each organ should only play their role as mandated by the constitution and the relevant laws. And uh, we wouldn't say that, um, um, for example, the concerted effort uh, are being derailed. I wouldn't say that. I would only say that each person must do their role as mandated by the court. But this is, let me talk a bit about uh, the point you, if I do not digress, mm -hmm. that uh, you're discussing with the justice. Go ahead. About supervision. Yes. The policy guidelines yeah, speaks about how to handle the vulnerable persons and special needs accused persons like the ones you have mentioned. But most importantly, it speaks about uh, uh, bail supervision for uh, certain characters as the court may dem demand. Uh, not uh, everybody just walks out after paying uh, cash bail or depositing the securities. Sometimes the court may be able to pose uh, conditions that you all have to abide by. And uh, in this country, we've not had conditions for strict conventional bail supervision as it were. But uh, you hear of uh, courts sometimes saying that uh, you report to your police station every fortnightly or every week or quite so often. Uh, may be considered as a, a form of bail supervision, but it is not bail supervision in the conventional meaning of, of, of that. Mm -hmm. And this policy guidelines therefore has uh, prescribed or given direction that uh, the Department of Probation would be able to, and, and, and in collaboration with the uh, national government and uh, would be able to supervise uh, certain categories of bailees as the court may demand. That is not happening in Kenya uh, right now because of the, uh, the weight of it. It's expensive and it would be difficult to manage all, all of our, I mean, of a certain. There has to be instruments to be put in place. There has to be a policy mandate. Beyond this policy, there has to be some uh, direct uh, legislation because it will come with a lot of many other things. Okay. And speaking of this committee, yeah. um, help us, help Kenyans and even myself understand perhaps the membership of this committee, the sitting and the decisions. Yeah, the membership of this committee comprises quite a, a range. Uh, we have the judiciary represented at two levels, uh, the chair and uh, a member mm -hmm. uh, who are judicial officers. Mm -hmm. uh, we have probation, we have the children's department, we have the NTC, uh, N NTSA. We have the uh, Office of the Director of Public Prosecution. We have the National Police Service. We have the Legal Resources Foundation. We have uh, the, uh, which are the entity? Prison. Prison. The prison, the Kenya Prison mm. Service. We have the Kenya Law, Reform, Kenya Law Reform Commission. And all of these are involved in the decision? All of them are involved in ensuring that this policy guideline is implemented. And uh, what we do, we hold sittings to review the extent to which this policy guideline is being done. And we also try to implement the decisions which the predecessor task force were able to come up with as uh, requiring uh, you know, implementation. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the policy guideline, the, this committee uh, sits quite regularly, hears many issues coming from the field, decides and uh, assists other parties, including at the court level. Like the judge said, we have been able to go around and monitor the level of implementation of this policy. Speaking to the parties, both at what we call the court user committees, I don't know whether you've heard of the court user committees at court levels, giving them audience, listening to the challenges they are, they are facing, talking to the accused person in demand custody, expand, expanding, expanding on them, on their rights, and what this policy guidelines talks about. And therefore, being able to ensure that Kenyans who deserve bail are being given bail at that local level. All right, um, Lady Justice. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can correct me, but as I was doing my research, I came across the fact that rape cases in Kenya have tighter bail and bond um, as compared to our corruption cases. Shouldn't, shouldn't we not borrow that same leaf when it comes to dealing with corruption cases? Okay, before I answer that one, I think we'll be failing if we do not mention one other very important point. Yes. And that is also the, what the Constitution says about bail yes. and bond. There are those offenses where somebody must be given bail and bond under Article 49.1.2. That is where the offense is punishable by a fine only or by a fine or, or imprisonment for a term less than six months. Mm -hmm. So those ones must be given bail. 
they should not be remanded in custody mm -hmm. or, or put in cells. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to say that. Now about, um, you see, uh, ca ca can I shock you about uh, one thing? You see, uh, murder is the worst kind of a crime, I would believe, because this is taking away life. Um, uh, we have le less absconding cases, abscondance cases in murder. Very few. In fact, mm -hmm. in my court, I've issued only one warrant of arrest for somebody who has absconded in, for, to come for trial for their murder case. For sexual offenses, many of them abscond. That is the reality. They don't show up. They don't show up, at, at, especially once you now say uh, we, you are satisfied there is a prima facie case and therefore the person should now defend themselves to show the, the court that they did not commit this mm -hmm. offense. The moment you reach that point, in many, well, in many instances, people abscond. I'm not saying all, but the percentage is higher in sexual offenses than all the other offenses that come before right. the court. Okay. So you cannot use now that leave for <coughs> corruption cases. Uh, you see that uh, for corruption cases you have had, have you ever had a warrant of arrest in a corruption case? Really hardly. Yeah, so you can't use uh, compare the two. We, we say that you look at the case in its own circumstances, you give merit eh, according to the circumstances are in, of each individual case. And to what extent does a presiding judge influence um, the bail of bond? A presiding judge? Yes. Yeah, the discretion is for that particular presiding judge to determine, or magistrate, because many of them go before magistrates. Eh? So you determine what kind of bond terms to post. But as we are saying, they must be reasonable bond terms. Because your interest here, especially the interest of the court, is to ensure that the person turns up for their trial. If you are satisfied they are not a flight risk, you are satisfied they will not endanger, endanger the lives of victims or influence witnesses, mm -hmm. you know, or, you know with evidence. those kind of, they, they will not interfere with the evidence or right. investigations of the case or anything like that, uh, they are not likely to abscond maybe flight take off to some other country because you must also check if this for instance those ones you are calling a very high level people you must check do they have connections abroad they might have assets or homes or something like that likely to abscond depending on the kind of case they are facing right so that's how you post it higher to make sure they, it would discourage them from uh, uh, you know going away otherwise uh, the discretion is for the court Okay. The duty to sh prove a reasonable uh, that there are, there are compelling reasons is the duty of the uh, prosecution. The, the duty to bring the evidence and so on, the prosecution can get that evidence either from the investigating officer, maybe the court can also get it from the probation officer. Sometimes also victims file statements. The, of late, we are seeing increasingly victims filing affidavits because they have, um, they, some have uh, maybe it's a public interest case. Civil society brings in lawyers who stand in for the victims. They, they file affidavits maybe from relative, close relatives of the victims to just say why they feel that the person should not uh, be granted bail. So the court has to listen to all those voices and weigh all the, this uh, evidence that is brought before them. And then they determine what kind of bond terms to grant if they are satisfied, bond should be given. Lady Justice, I won't be doing this inter, uh, justice to this conversation if I didn't ask you um, personally, what inspired you out of all the things that you could have perhaps decided to do under law, corporate law, family law, divorce law, why criminal law? Uh, no, criminal law is not uh, my choice at all. Mm -hmm. But law, to do law was my choice. Mm -hmm. And uh, my inspiration was my father, although he was working in human resource. Uh, he, he was a human uh, resources manager. Um, he, he, I saw how he balanced issues of justice and fairness and, uh, you know, interests of other people, less fortunate in the society, and he inspired me. So he kept t telling me that we must give people the justice that they, they deserve. They deserve. And you? that is what drove me to do law. Wow. And have you ever regretted maybe a bail or bond that you've given to an accused and you felt I shouldn't have? There is one I re regret. At the very beginning when this thing, when the constitution, new 2010 constitution came up, and uh, we, we, I now found myself having the, the power 
to grant bail to mm -hmm. murders, um, mm -hmm. you know, murder, pa persons accused with murder. And we didn't know how to assess. But I, I, the first thing I did was to ask for a probation report. In fact, I'm the one who started that uh, probation report thing. Uh, we still don't have a law saying we must have it, but there's nothing to prevent us from asking for it. So I asked for a probation report, and the report which came said that the life of the accused person may be in danger if he's released. You see, this was the beginning of uh, this, uh, um, yeah, uh, you know, uh, granting of uh, bond to persons facing very serious offenses that, that like murder. Right. So they, they said, if you release, this person is uh, likely to be, be in danger. And I, I put that to the, uh, the defense. I told them, the report I have is that if you are released, uh, you, will, you will, may not spend a night. And truly, actually, I, they say they insist that, they, 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 that the police have the duty to take okay. care of them and that they, don't, they, they, they do not have any fear. They will be able to maneuver. How? And they actually were killed after I released them. Ah. So that one I regret, that I should have actually listened to the other voice, okay. which I already had. I'm curious, how do you unwind after a long day or after a long week? How does Lady Justice, let's sit at wind? I, I pray to God that mm. it relaxes me. I spend time in prayer. Yes, it building your spiritual man. And also reading the word of God. All right. Thank yeah. you so much for your time. Mm. That was Lady Justice Jessie Lesit. She is the presiding judge with the criminal division as well as the chair of Bail and